Good morning, sir. Yes, uh, it's been a indeed since a long time but i think i have maybe something which might interest you today i remember you are you were interested in superconductivity and you encouraged me that time to pursue this it took me a long time but i started to look into it finally <laughs> great great so, good evening Good, good afternoon. Evening. <laughs> well, I am going to do, I am going to present today, okay, Avino? Well. Yes, okay. I know. Nice. Okay, uh, well, we are going to start now. We are online. Uh, estamos todos en línea. Bienvenidos a todos. Buenos días. Uh, el día de hoy est estamos en eh, nuestras charlas permanentes de todos los sábados de este año eh, de la red latinoamericana de física de materia condensada y ciencia de los materiales. El día de hoy tenemos la presencia del doctor Adrian Ionesco. Adrian Ionesco from, de la Universidad de Cambridge, en el Reino Unido. From, Adrian, doctor Adrian Ionesco from the University of Cambridge, uh, from the United Kingdom. Adrian Ionesco is going to give us a very interesting, uh, interesting talk um, in different topics that he has been working during the last uh, years in bulk materials, nanomaterials, thin films, and many materials that he has been working, he has been investigating. Adrian Ionesco has, is affiliated with the University of Cambridge from more than 20 years, I think, more if I am not, more than 20 years, and in the TFM group of the Cavendish Laboratory, Department of Physics, the University of Cambridge. Well, uh, um, he's a very nice friend of us. Um, and also he has visited, también él ha visitado Perú, el doctor Adrian Ionesco ha visitado Perú varias veces, ha visitado uh, varias universidades en Perú y ha dado charlas en la Universidad de San Marcos, en la Conferencia Latinoamericana de Física de uh, Superconductividad y Magnetismo. No? Perfect. Well, uh, well, welcome Adrian Ionescu, uh, Dr. Adrian Ionescu from the University of Cambridge. And you can share your screen, please, and start your talk. Okay, thank you very much, Luis. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for the invitation. I will uh, try to share now my uh, screen. Let me know if it works. Um, you should hopefully see now yes uh, the slides yeah. Yeah. yeah you can see yes yes okay thank you so uh rather than to uh, force you onto a talk um on some subjects which you might or might not like i decided that i would give you a suggestion a suggested um outlook of certain things, as Louis said, uh, we're on which I have worked on in the last few years, um, starting maybe with the introduction on spintronics, but there was already a very good one two weeks ago by uh, Professor Resede from Brazil. Uh, so maybe I will keep that very short and then maybe the audience can choose from the following subjects on which uh, I had worked. So one would have been topological insulators, uh, that is one of the subjects which I could present. The graphene ferromagnet interfaces, uh, that is something which we are ab aiming to publish um, shortly. Uh, oxide interfaces, what I mean here is uh, europium oxide, lanthanum, aluminium oxide, and the search for um, a two dimensional electron gas. Uh, nanoparticles, uh, in particular, core shell, a single. single um, single stoichiometry, but core shell particles um, uh, such as nickel oxide, I would discuss in this in this talk. Uh, I had presented this also that time in uh, Lima in 2017-18 at the conference in more detail. Um, and then cube on hexagon epitaxy. Um, so over the last few years, several materials um, have been tried to be grown on sapphire or other hexagonal uh, substrates 
by molecular beam epitaxy or sputtering other physical vapor deposition techniques and the problems which uh, have emerged. We had here this case of iron on gallium nitride. And then uh, the last two topics is spin polarized energy electron loss spectroscopy. Um, a technique which we have developed to study the band structure um, of materials uh, in collaboration with uh, a, a group in Japan uh, the national, at the National Institute of Material Science. And then finally, um, uh, the superconducting diode effect, uh, which I've started working with the group in the material science department at the uh, university. Um, that would be the, the last possible topic. So each of them are about um, 15 minutes at most. And um, I would say if the esteemed audience, I see there are about 18 people now, uh, could raise maybe their hands uh, about the topics while I read them out and we choose two or three and I will uh, discuss those with, with those with you. So, um, Luis, can you keep an eye on the reactions, please? Jeff, I think that we people are interested nowadays in uh, some of um, spintronics, oxide interface, and nanoparticles. Okay. Yeah, well, I uh, mean, could we have a vote? I'm a <laughs> I'm a Democrat, so maybe uh, if everyone could raise their hands, I, I will read out the topics and uh, maybe okay. we count the hands and see how much interests are in the in the different. Um, topics. So my, my first suggestion would be uh, topological insulators. Is there uh, any interest in this? Uh, can you raise your hands if you if you do have any interest to, li uh, to listen into that? So I, I look at the where is the chat? Luis, do you see the chat? Yeah, the chat says the superconducting diode effect. Professor Albino is suggesting. Okay. Uh, I was guessing this already. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a uh, nanoparticles. Okay. And uh, maybe one more, uh, one more topic. Uh, another topic. This says uh, spectronics. Says a. Uh, what well, the spectronics is uh, the portmanteau is the introduction. Uh, it's it's nothing uh, specific. It's. Um, so it's just an introduction to the whole of the the the, the talk. Um, there, 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 the, there, are, there are some students from Kazakhstan here attending, and yeah. they will be very happy as well to be quite basic as well. Okay. Yeah, I will introduce uh, the, the concepts uh, initially, um, but then I thought that on the main materials. Uh, Stuart Holmes uh, is suggesting oxide interfaces, interfaces and diode and effect. Diode effect. Okay. Okay, so I think that uh, the superconducting diode effect uh, has appeared there uh, a few times. So we'll we'll have a look on, on this. Um, and people also students are asking for a superconducting. Uh, Eliana diode effect. Okay, we, we'll have a, also, okay, we're we're gonna look at the superconducting diode effect. Uh, no one with the graphene. <laughs> uh, that was uh, or uh, spin polarized electron loss spectroscopy. Uh, okay. Um, so what else was mentioned? Oxide interfaces. Okay, that is, uh, I see here, topological insulators and nanoparticles. Uh, okay, what about, uh, then I start with the, uh, with the general introduction and people can still some, uh, choose some of the things. And we, we see as, as the votes come in, what else I will uh, talk about. Okay, so uh, let me start then um, on Springtronics. So we had two weeks ago uh, already Professor Resende from Brazil giving sorry, a can much you, more Can you maximize, uh, sorry, can you maximize your presentation? So it means that should full screen? Uh, it should, uh, at least on mine, it is full screen. Ah, no, can no, no. Ah. It's not fully screen. Maybe you you need to you need to unshare and then share again your screen. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I will yeah. do this. Yeah. Okay, let me do this. Could well be. Mm, this could well be okay. Para los que se conectan, este de Perú, vayan dejando sus preguntas en las redes sociales de las 
las redes sociales de donde están siguiendo esta transmisión. En Colombia, el público latinoamericano pueden dejar sus preguntas en las redes sociales. Al final de la charla, el doctor Elian Ionescu de la Universidad de Cambridge, eh, van a, eh, los estudiantes van a transmitir sus preguntas. Ok, thank you. It's full screen now. It's full. Yes, now it's okay. Bye bye. Okay, okay. So it was probably because I, I had stopped sharing for a while. Okay, so you should have now. So, um, there was two weeks ago already a quite good talk by Professor Resende. Uh, he went much more into detail. Uh, I will just outline the field of spintronics, which is a portmanteau for meaning really spin transport electronics. It was also sometimes known as magneto electronics when it first started, uh, which is a technology which has been ongoing for about 20, 30 years. Uh, maybe even earlier, uh, we, we see um, in 1971, the spin hole effect, which has been predicted by Diakonov and Perel. Uh, and what it wants to do is to exploit both the intrinsic spin of the electron and its ac associated magnetic moment, uh, in addition to the electronic charge, which is already used in solid state uh, electronic devices. Um, and the, the spin hole effect, which was that time predicted, has uh, some similarity to a certain extent uh, to the normal hole effect in the in the typical hole effect you you pass a current through um, a certain wire let's say or a, um, uh, it's depicted on the left and you you uh, apply a magnetic field perpendicular to the current and then you measure a voltage uh, across this wire and uh, similarly you can have this uh, spin hole effect where you have uh, here, instead of separation of the charges in the whole effect, you have separations of the spin. Oh. Uh, historically, maybe one could say that indeed it started in the 70s um, with uh, tunneling experiments, sorry, um, tunneling experiments uh, between ferromagnets and superconductors, uh, pioneered by Tedrov and Mercevé. Um, and maybe with magnetic tunnel junctions from Julia. This was all in the 1970s. But uh, then really it emerged uh, in the 1980s uh, when um, spin-dependent electron transport for, uh, phenomena in solid state devices uh, were uh, studied, um, such as maybe the spin-polarized electron injection from a ferromagnetic metal to a normal metal by Johnson and Sillisby in 1985. Clearly, the, the heydays, uh, it reached uh, in 2007 with the award of the Physics Nobel Prize uh, to Albert Fert and Peter Greenberg uh, for the discovery of the giant magnetoresistance, uh, uh, abbreviated GMR, which then was used uh, widely uh, in uh, magnetic um, hard drives. Uh, but there were different fields uh, on which we are worked uh, during the years. And one was uh, the so-called spin field effect transistor, which was uh, proposed by Data and Das in the 90s, uh, stimulated a lot of research to combine ferromagnetic metals with uh, semiconductors. Um, as I mentioned, motivation was application to the solid uh, state um, industry. Uh, one of the most used uh, was uh, the hardest drive, still today to a certain to a certain extent in use, um, uh, where you store uh, information uh, in uh, in uh, magnetic uh, little clusters as zero and one, and you can read it out with your uh, GMR hat. Um, I think nowadays it's even TMR hat. Uh, but as we know, by now it has been superseded almost by solid state drives. Um, so it, they are still used today. Many of us are probably using it as a colder storage, um, as a backup uh, disk. Another uh, very promising development initially was the magnetic random access memory, um, where you would use uh, magnetic storage elements instead of uh, electronic ones. Um, and uh, this uh, promised, it has been developed, but again, remained a bit of a niche technology, uh, promised direct access to your computer. Um, again, I think uh, the, the concept had been with the time so past, but stimulated a lot of uh, research 
looking forward to really, I think what, what we, what, where the future lies in the output of spintronics or magnetoelectronics is really the proposed application of spin qubits uh, into quantum computing. Um, and there are a few uh, suggestions how this can be implemented, be it with uh, ferromagnetic insulators or superconductors um, and many other suggestions. So I think that, that is maybe the, the most uh, fascinating uh, uh, aspect of uh, the outcome, potential outcome of uh, spintronics and implementation uh, for the future. So uh, having given this uh, brief introduction, maybe I can have a look again what uh, people were, were asking oxide interfaces and diode effects. Okay, Let, let's uh, start there. Uh, I might have to share, I think again, um, I need to jump a little bit. Um, okay, let me take you to the oxide interfaces. Right. Um, so. Um, you stop sharing, Adrian. Yeah, I should. I should now share new, and hopefully you should see it. Can you see yes. now? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, this was some work which we have started a few years ago, but uh, it took quite a long time. It was postulated um, that when you uh, use europium oxide, which is a ferromagnetic insulator, and you grow this on lanthanum aluminum oxide, you would create a two-dimensional uh, electron ga uh, uh, gas, which uh, has, of course, quite far-reaching implication if this should prove true. This was all calculated based on density functional theory. And we thought, okay, let's have a look. Uh, the major work was performed by one of our students, Razan Abod Yadayel. And uh, the, 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 the technique which we decided to use in order to study whether or not this two dimension electron gas emerges were uh, based on particle uh, physics. Uh, in, in, in this case, it was uh, muon spin uh, relaxation and um, polarized neutron reflection. Uh, in particular, we wanted to use low energy muon spin rotation. It's a bit like electron spin rotation, ESR, but here instead of the electron, we, we study the rotation of its uh, feta brother, the muon. Um, it, in fact, it is actually a, a, a positive muon. Uh, and um, you create, uh, this was done in, in Switzerland at the Pau Scherer Institute. Uh, you create a, a beam of spin polarized muons, which are um, accelerated and stopped in your sample. So they are implanted in your sample. And uh, the, the muon has a certain lifetime of uh, on average 2.2 microseconds and decays then into a positron and two neutrinos. And depending, of course, on the internal magnetic field, the muon, which, as I said, is the is similar to an uh, electron has spin a half particle uh, rotates around the internal magnetic field in your sample, then dies and due to or decays and then due to conservation of the total angular momentum emits the positron in the direction uh, of the uh, field to a certain ex extent. You you have two uh, you have two po uh, possibilities. You can do this without any applied field, so in the zero field uh, setup, or in the weak transversal field setup where you induce a small magnetization in your sample around which the muon should process uh, before it's decaying, and then you you basically collect the positrons and you can study. Um, the internal field distribution in your sample, uh, the magnetic field distribution in your sample. Um, so we tried basically to use this technique um, to, to study this creation of this proposed two-dimensional electron gas at the interface between lanthanum aluminum or, or oxide and europium oxide. Um, I need maybe to uh, tell you a little bit about europium oxide. Uh, it is, um, I said, a ferromagnetic insulator, has a magnetic moment about seven mu bore per atom, a Curie temperature of 69 Kelvin. 
a band cap of 1.2 electron volts at room temperature and uh, below the Curie temperature, it has a spin splitting of uh, 0.6 electron volts uh, between spin up and spin down uh, electrons, um, making it uh, almost 100% spin polarized uh, below TC. Um, and uh, there were uh, a few groups uh, which used uh, density functional theory to predict that uh, when you create this interface between lanthanum aluminum oxide and uh, EO, you create uh, this two-dimensional uh, electron gas as is shown on the, uh, on the bottom um, of this slide. Um, they postulated mechanisms which they, they stated to create this uh, spin polarized uh, two deck uh, was uh, either that there is a polar catastrophe, that means um, in the lanthanum aluminum oxide, you have uh, stacks of aluminum O2 and lanthanum um, oxide, and each of this uh, layer are either positive or negatively charged. So you have like an inbuilt electric field, and this inbuilt electric field in the lanthanum aluminum oxide creates a charge so plus uh, at the EOO interface. And because of the spin polarization of the EOO, you have de facto then some kind of uh, spin polarized electron gas at, at this interface. There were also discussion of thermal interdiffusion or the creation of oxygen vacancies, which should lead to the same result of this spin polarized uh, two-dimensional electron gas. So uh, we said, okay, let's try and see uh, whether these simulations are right. Uh, so we had to create first uh, lanthanum oxide terminated. And in contrast, we wanted to have also aluminum uh, dioxide terminated interfaces, which was a bit more tricky. We couldn't achieve this. Uh, we got a bit of more of a mixed interface, uh, depending on the synthesis uh, methods. Uh, but we could create this lanthanum uh, monoxide terminated uh, surfaces, which were uh, stipulated to create this two uh, dimensional electron gas. And then uh, once we prepared the substrates, we uh, grew europium monoxide uh, thin films by magnetron sputtering of um, europium and europium 203 at room temperature uh, but due to co uh, deposition and capped it with gold or sometimes with platinum, in this case with gold. Uh, measured then the structural properties to check basically for the um, termination, uh, either single lanthanum monoxide terminated or uh, mixed terminated. Uh, and th that uh, we could infer basically by uh, the step heights uh, in the AFM scan, uh, scan here. We did also uh, do XRD and um, XRR, so XRD to check that uh, we have really grown europium monoxide um, almost epitaxially as we could onto lantern uh, aluminum oxide um, and uh, XRR to infer uh, information about the roughnesses between uh, the two uh, layers. Uh, I think that uh, my colleague, um, Dr. Newton had introduced you already in his talk, uh, the low temperature scanning polar MOC microscope. Uh, so I will not dwell too much. This was maybe a month ago or so when he gave his talk. We used uh, low temperature MOC uh, basically to, uh, similar as you image the uh, um, structural domain by atomic force microscopy, you can, um, you can image the, the magnetic domains um, of, of your sample by a low temperature magnetic optical Kerr effect imaging, and you can see the domains. One thing what you see here as well is um, that the domains have certain shapes, um, um, that they are uh, slightly tetragonal and they oppose each other. That is because uh, the lanthanum aluminum oxide crystal is a monoclinic crystal and often twinned. So you never really get um, a single um, terrace, let's say, or a single surface uh, with this monoclinic um, crystals. And instead you get this mosaic uh, forms. Uh, 
we, we studied then the, uh, the magnetic properties by uh, a superconducting quantum interference device uh, and, and checked um, in which direction the easy magnetic axis is. This was all necessary for our final uh, experiments. And then once we were happy that we had the right structure, we, we took it to uh, Switzerland for low energy muon spin rotation, which we performed there in, uh, in uh, as I said, weak transversal field and zero fields. Um, uh, the results are shown on the top. And what you have is a kind of an asymmetry as you, 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 you do a time scan um, and uh, the signal uh, decreases uh, in two exponential ways, uh, one with a, a, a quick relaxation, uh, a, a little lambda, uh, where, which uh, inf contains information about uh, the magnetization along, for instance, the applied field, and uh, large lambda there, the, the, fa uh, the fast relaxation, uh, which contains information about the field perpendicular um, to the spin uh, procession of the um, muon. And uh, we, we then took this information and um, studied basically, um, depending on the energy of implantation, you can uh, implant the muons further away from the interface, so into the bulk of the europium oxide or uh, closer to the interface, uh, so where you where we were expecting the two-dimensional electron gas, and we wanted to compare if there is any difference between uh, the information collected in the bulk or at the interface where this two-deck, this pinpolarized two-deck should be, because in the presence of this two-deck, we would have expected an additional magnetic signature, an enhanced magnetic moment, uh, maybe at the interface. But mostly as we were scanning through the different samples, we could see that there was no much difference whether we implanted the, the muons um, shallow or deep into the material. Uh, comparing this to data which we had previously obtained on pure europium monoxide and uh, oxygen efficient europium monoxide, uh, we could not clearly quantified that there is any presence of a two-dimensional electron gas as it was uh, postulated uh, theoretically by densely functional theory. Uh, in fact, it, it looked that uh, there was nothing um, but uh, that said th there are limitations uh, to the usage of low energy muon spin rotation techniques to um, properties of um, ultra thin um, regions uh, at the interfaces. So we decided that uh, as there was no clear indication of a two dimensional electron gas at this interface, that we would do a polarized neutron uh, reflectivity data. Um, uh, so do neutron scattering with polarized neutrons uh, to have a better view on, on this point. But uh, one conclusion which we drew is uh, that you, one has to be very careful when uh, when trying to um, to to follow computational modeling uh, and uh, as experimental results can be uh, completely different, um, even if you use the best software packages. So we we haven't published anything around this, so it is quite new uh, what you hear here. Uh, but we are still working on it. And with this, I would like to, to stop this, uh, this talk. Is there any questions about this uh, system? You should, Adrian, usually the questions are at the end. Okay, okay, I can do this. Right, okay, so please then keep hold of your uh, questions for the moment. Um, right, so, uh, I see that next was uh, the superconducting diode effect. Uh, I will go to this. Uh, this is the, oh, or can I, I think Lewis wanted the nanoparticles and as he invited me, <laughs> I have to feel obliged. Is, is this okay, Lewis? Uh, I will share again my, my screen. Yes, so, the, the nanoparticles and also the, the superconducting will be okay. The will diode be nice. effect, okay, let, let's do this. I'm a bit disappointed I can't speak about the graphene um, or the spin polarized uh, electron loss spectroscopy, but maybe for another time. Okay, so 
let's have a look on core shell nanomagnet or magnetism and nickel oxide nanoparticles. Uh, this was already a few years ago that we have done it, but uh, I think it is one of the neatest results uh, which we have obtained on, on nanoparticles, uh, which find uh, a lot of applications, not necessarily now in spintronics, but uh, really in, uh, in medicine, for instance, uh, in healthcare, such as for magnetic resonance images, targeted drug delivery or, or uh, treatment of solid tumors by hyperthermia. Um, and for many of those applications, really, um, you need to determine the, uh, the magnetic moment and the active magnetic uh, volume. And uh, so it happens that many years ago uh, with a colleague uh, from biochemistry, uh, Dr. Darton, uh, we were uh, trying to do uh, targeted drug delivery. On the top left, you see results of um, uh, colloidal ferro ferromagnetic uh, or ferrofluid uh, in, a, in a magnetic field as measured by an, um, uh, uh, what was it, in an, uh, a nuclear magnetic resonance setup. And uh, you see the motion of the ferrofluid up an application of, um, of a uh, uh, magnetic field in time. And you could calculate basically uh, the magnetic moment per nanoparticle uh, by using what you see on the right, the Langevin uh, formula. But often, or mainly all the time, whenever you extracted the magnetic volume and compared it to the uh, physical volume, maybe which you get from uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy or uh, X ray diffraction, you will see that they don't fit. So the magnetic volume becomes always smaller uh, than uh, the, the physical volume. So we thought, is there something to it? Um, and devised initially, we thought we, we should do some experiments. And because I'm, I'm I would always say I'm, I'm a kind of a particle physicist, which ended up to do magnetism in the condensed matter community. Um, I thought of a polarized small angle neutron scattering uh, initially, uh, where you would put a single layer of um, magnetic nanoparticles like iron oxide uh, dispersed on a substrate. And then at shallow angles, you, you measure uh, the response. Unfortunately, our proposals uh, at that time, there was only really one or, or were two stations in the world which had polarized small angle neutron scattering. That was one was in Grenoble in France and the other one was in uh, the US. Um, our proposal was rejected uh, several times uh, and I got increasingly furious. Um, but in the meantime, uh, the Americans, they, they came up uh, by themselves with the idea uh, to do this and they use their station um, to, to do such measurements of, uh, of iron oxide nanoparticles um, dispersed on a substrate with polarized suns. Uh, I, we weren't aware exactly at, at that time uh, of, of their doing. Um, and then one of my colleagues, a, a student at that time, Josh Daniel Cooper, he came with the idea and said, hey, what, what about let's forget polarized small angle neutron scattering, let's just do classical uh, neutron diffraction. Elia, Elia, sorry for the yes. interruption. Uh, people want to read the, <clears throat> the, the reference that you are provided in the bottom. Can you hide the, yes. the, that one hide? Please. Okay, thank yes. you. Yes, so, thank you, sorry. Um, so neutron diffraction, you, you usually, I mean, this is uh, like X-ray diffraction, but you need copious amount of your materials. Uh, so instead of uh, having to produce maybe by uh, precipitation methods, a few milligrams of nanoparticles we were faced uh, that we would need to create grams of our nanoparticles. Uh, and we found that uh, someone at um, uh, UCL, uh, University College London, they had developed um, a method to create large, large quantities of nanoparticles uh, in a reactor. And they were very happy um, to do this uh, by rapid thermal synthesis to, uh, to provide us with nickel monoxide nanoparticle, which are antiferromagnetic. Uh, we also did this with ferromagnetic ion 304, but I think it is easier to understand 
the principle of nickel oxide um, uh, and the analysis of the results. So that's why I will focus on nickel monoxide. So um, we did an TEM studies in XRD to get uh, the average size of the nickel monoxide particles, which was about six nanometers, uh, um, and also study their crystallinity. You see there are uh, uh, yeah, a, a single phase basically. And uh, then we went to do a neutron diffraction, um, which uh, not only provides you information about the structure as X-ray diffraction will do, but because the neutron has a spin, you can also infer information from the magnetization. Uh, and in this case, um, what we can see, you see the two uh, plots at 550 nickel oxide, and at 5K, uh, 5 Kelvin, uh, which is below the ordering, the nail temperature of nickel oxide, you see at very small angles, another peak appearing, which comes from the scattering of the uh, neutron spin by the magnetic uh, potential. Uh, it is um, therefore solely correlated to the magnetization and not to the structure. Sure, um, here is a, a, another a slightly better view of this. Uh, so uh, to, to, to be a bit more precise, nickel monoxide uh, has, is an antiferromagnet, with, as I said, has a sodium chloride uh, structure for most of the times. Once you cool it below nail temperature, there is a, a slight tendency uh, to uh, to move away from sodium chloride, but in large, it is still the sodium chloride structure. The nail temperature um, is 523 Kelvin, so the measurements at 550 were clearly taken above and those at five below the ordering, uh, antiferromagnetic ordering. Uh, the moments are in the 111 plane in nickel oxide. Um, and uh, we left those particles uh, really uncoated um, just to avoid incoherent scattering from uh, hydrogen if you would uh, somehow functionalize them. And then we used what many people would do uh, for X-ray diffraction or neutron scattering, the Scherer equation to get uh, a nanoparticle size. And when you look at um, structural peaks, um, then you get basically the structural particle size of a diameter of 65 angstroms, uh, where if you looked at the core, what, at the magnetic peak, this additional peak, which appeared at five Kelvin, you got a diameter of about 51 angstroms. So there was a clear indication that indeed the ma magnetic um, volume and the structural volume are different uh, here. Uh, we wanted then to uh, submit this to a uh, physical review B, uh, but this guy said, no, um, we, we would like you to, the referee said, uh, we would like to have a look and understand what's going there um, on, whether it's some kind of spin glass behavior that the surface behaves differently uh, than the, the core. Uh, and we did had uh, measured already uh, some very weird, um, magnetization loops, uh, as it is an antiferromagnet, you see at the bottom left, you, uh, at low temperatures, we, we ob ob observed a hysteretic behavior. And when we measured isotherms, you saw that there was something going on when it was going from a, a paramagnetic state, uh, which you would maybe expect from antiferromagnet um, uh, at 375 Kelvin towards lower temperatures, uh, towards 10 Kelvin, that it, it, you, you moved to a state of higher magnetic anisotropy somehow below 10 Kelvin. Uh, and it, it ended up, as I said, in this uh, hysteresis loops, uh, which are shown at the bottom at five Kelvin, uh, which were uh, measured with field cooling and zero field cooling, um, respectively shown in red and black. Uh, which seem to indicate some kind of competing anisotropy contributions, possibly uh, due to uh, spin arrangements from the core, uh, so the nickel oxide, or from uh, from from the the surface. And as I said, there was one postulation that this has something to do with the spin glass, or a superparamagnetic behavior. We tried to model 
uh, a super paramagnetic antiferromagnet uh, by using the nail formula, but it didn't work very well. And then we we modeled a spin glass where where you uh, you make a measurement, you you saturate your sample, and then you measure the decay of the remnants in time and fit this to the equation shown here. Um, but the results gave you uh, some unphysical um, results um, so that it didn't seem that it had really to do anything with spin glass. Uh, that said, I, mu I must mention that there was not much more research done into spin glass in the last decades, to my knowledge. So I don't know whether um, more information uh, are in the meantime available. But finally, the, the referee uh, agreed or the referees agreed that we had enough data in convincing data and allowed to uh, publish us. So um, we basically uh, submitted this then and um, uh, I, I think showed that uh, you can use this neutron diffraction, standard neutron diffraction to extract the sizes of nanoparticles um, and that we have delivered an unambiguous proof that indeed the surface layer of these nanoparticles um, is differently magnetized than, than the core. Uh, so not only have we delivered a, te a technique, which in the meantime, a lot of people have started using to, to study their magnetic nanoparticle, but yet you can also actually quantify the thickness of this uh, disordered uh, shell. Uh, I, I mentioned that uh, we have done also iron 304, and so you, you don't you don't have to constrain yourself to antiferromagnetic uh, nanoparticles. It can also be ferromagnetic or ferrimagnetic. We choose antiferromagnetic nickel oxide because uh, you have no additional contribution from the magnetization to the structural peaks, uh, which you would have uh, in the case of a ferro or ferry magnet. So uh, we would have we were able to extract pure magnetic information from our uh, a half, a half, a half peak at, 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 at low angles compared uh, against uh, pure uh, structural information from our structural peaks. So there was no uh, magnetic information hidden in the higher angle peaks. That's why we choose nickel oxide. We also choose nickel oxide in contrast to uh, cobalt oxide because uh, it is a, a self-terminating oxide, so there is no other oxide which forms. Uh, and we could then uh, assume that this is all um, a single material. Cobalt monoxide transforms into cobalt 304. So often on the surface, you would have had uh, some other um, material. So that is why uh, we choose uh, this system. And we were very pleased finally when we were able to publish these results. So with this, I should then move, I think, to the last part, uh, the superconducting diode effect. Um, I think I need to share one more time. Okay. Oh no, sorry, oh no. That was a mistake. Please bear with me. Do you see the full screen now? Yes. Luis? Yes? Yes. The full yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I recently, uh, so yes, I've, I've worked for many years in the physics department, uh, Cavendish Laboratory in the Thin Film Magnetist Group which is now the quantum information group. Uh, but I moved recently part-time uh, to another group to the Center of Material Physics, which is uh, located in the Department of Material Science and Metallurgy and, and work there with uh, Professor Robinson's group. Um, these guys have been working on uh, superconducting thin films for a long time. So um, for me, it's quite a new adventure. Um, my, my, uh, exposure to superconductivity has been more than 20 years ago and through some collaboration sometimes with Lewis. Uh, but here I will talk about some results uh, which have been recently obtained uh, on the proximity effect and non-reciprocal transport in superconducting europium sulfide uh, niobium thin films. So europium sulfide, uh, similar to europium oxide, is a ferromagnetic insulator. 
uh, it, it crystallizes in the same um, crystal structure. Uh, it has a lower, um, it has a lower um, order temperature. It's, I think it's about 19 Kelvin, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but but what the I, I idea here is is uh, basically the penetration of um, of triplets into an uh, of uh, of a triplet pair into into the ferromagnet. So. Uh, if you have, a, if you look at the superconducting order parameter at the superconductor normal metal interface, which is shown on the on the left, uh, for a triplet pair there is no no possibility, not in the superconductor, and uh, hence nothing in the normal metal. So you have your uh, your uh, singlet state, and that uh, diffuses and dies out um, in the normal metal uh, after a while. Uh, this is not the same um, when you uh, replace the normal metal with the ferromagnet. Then uh, you have some kind of oscillation. The the Cooper pain pairs gain some center of mass momentum R, and you have some spatial modulated order parameters. So the singlet and the triplet pairs uh, show some some features in the weak polarized uh, ferromagnet. Um, we are really interested in the long range triplets, um, uh, which uh, go through the ferromagnet through spin rotation and spin mixing. Uh, so if you use here some kind of non colloidal spin arrangement uh, and a non vanishing berry phase, you can uh, create those in, in your ferromagnetic insulator uh, and they can carry their spin angular momentum over a very large um, distance. So what is this superconducting uh, diode effect? Um, normally, when you have uh, an ohmic resistance, you have a linear behavior between um, voltage and uh, current, uh, which will be your resistance, and it's depicted on the left. But if you have a superconductor, then you have a transition at a certain temperature, uh, the critical temperature, and then you have a uh, this, you don't have this linear behavior anymore. You have very, basically an, an uh, area where you have zero resistance in the ideal case uh, of a superconductor. And then you have a, a critical current which sets on um, uh, and then above it, you, you will have uh, again an ohmic conduction. So, um, so far so good, this is all known. Um, the, the question is, you, can we create some kind of imbalance in the critical current um, so that the, the 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 current, if whether it goes in one or the other direction, is non-reciprocal? And it turns out that uh, you can do it by um, creating a space inversion and time inversion. Uh, so in our particular experiment, uh, we used niobium as a superconductor and deposited um, europium sulfide, as I said, as a uh, ferromagnetic insulator, 30 nanometers, and then kept it again with uh, niobium uh, uh, in a thermal evaporator, uh, sorry, not a uh, e-beam evaporator in a UHV chamber. This, uh, these structures were grown on uh, silicon, silicon O2 wafers. And then we measured uh, the critical temperature of this, uh, this stack to be about 5.25 Kelvin. I think this is limited by the thickness of the niobium uh, used. Uh, we measured the coercive fields of europium sulfide to be about 45 Ersteds. And uh, then we pr pr processed this uh, into some kind of hole bars, which are shown at the bottom. You see there a schematic which shows you the layer, the niobium uh, in orange and slightly pale, the europium sulfide. Um, then what we do is basically we, we, we pass a current through this whole bar in the direction of the red arrow um, and apply perpendicular to it uh, magnetic field H, which uh, then depending on the direction of the, uh, of the H as we sweep it uh, reverses the magnetization. We swept the field from about minus 500 to 500 Ersteds and the current uh, in two directions from minus five amps uh, to five, uh, one, sorry, from minus 1.5 milliamps to 1.5 uh, milliamps. Uh, the, the setup which we are using um, 
is a dry cryogenic system uh, in which you can apply uh, magnetic fields in this system up to one Tesla uh, and you can cool down to about um, 1.3 Kelvin. Uh, so it's cryogen free because you, you don't have to waste all the time helium. It's a recirculation uh, set up here from a company called um, Cryogenics, which we, uh, we have used for this. Uh, and here are the results. Uh, I don't know whether you can see it very clearly. Um, so uh, the, the, what, what you show, see on the bottom left is the, the voltage current characteristics. Um, as we alter the ap applied field, you see basically a kind of hysteretic behavior in uh, your VI curves at two Kelvin. Um, so below the critical uh, uh, temperature. At the same time, we look at uh, basically the critical current that is where uh, where the where the halfway where the current basically shoots up, um, and we plot this as a this is shown in the center as a dependence of the magnetic field. Uh, for for the, uh, for a positive and for the negative uh, side of the current, and then uh, take the difference between those two uh, to uh, have delta E C the the difference uh, in the critical current as we sweep the the current and the magnetic field. So we see basically that uh, the transport behavior, uh, depending on the direction of the current flow and the applied magnetic field is non-reciprocal. Um, so we, we then also change a little bit the temperature um, and see that this is, is quite uh, robust. Um, we go here from 2 Kelvin to 2.8 um, and see that the behavior doesn't alter greatly. Uh, we focus next a little bit on, as I said, the, the difference between the positive critical current and the negative uh, critical current and its temperature dependence. And we see, of course, that uh, as we approach the critical temperature L5.25, uh, it, it decreases what you would expect because it is a superconducting uh, effect or a proximity effect due to superconductivity and, and ferromagnet. Uh, which uh, leads us to the same critical temperature uh, at 5.25 Kelvin, which we had previously measured by the um, RT measurements. Uh, so uh, what we can conclude is basically that uh, this superconducting diode um, shows a, a large promise. So basically it has resistance, zero resistance in one direction and a finite uh, resistance in the other, which can then be tuned basically by an uh, applied magnetic field externally. Uh, and I think uh, that is uh, something um, which might interest the superconducting uh, community. Um, and uh, I expect there will be some questions about this. Hopefully uh, I can answer them. But with this, basically, I, I would like to, uh, to thank you for all for uh, your attention. I would like to thank all the different students, postdocs, and professors who have worked with me on all these topics uh, over the, the years, even if I, I wasn't able to, to show their work. Uh, I would like finally to also to raise attention about the book which I've published uh, a few years ago on magnetic nanoparticles in biosensing and medicine, which contains uh, uh, a crash course in magnetism on the nanoscale, which I had written uh, and published with uh, Cambridge uh, University Press. Um, and uh, with this, muchas gracias. Cualquier uh, preguntas, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, I'm happy to take them now. So thank you also for the invitation and your patience. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Elian Ionescu, for your nice talk. Uh, muchas gracias, Dr. Elian Ionescu, for su excelente charla. Because we have a very big audience today, uh, we are going to just shorten it one question per 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 uh, panelist. Okay, yes. Uh, Professor Arturo Martinez says that he has not questions, but I would like to 
mention him just to a very short introduction to Professor Relian, who is the head of uh, the uh, editor in chief of the journal. And Professor Arturo Martinez has uh, joined the, the, uh, the editor board these uh, last days. Okay, well, uh, we are going to start then with a question with the representative from the University of San Marcos, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Physics of the University of San Marcos, uh, Professor Angel Bustamante, decano de la Facultad de Ciencias Físicas de la Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos, quien es el host de estas charlas. Ángel, your camera, please, Ángel. Hay problema con la cámara. Ok. <clears throat> bueno, eh, thank you very much for your, for your con, conference. Eh, I think eh, my, 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 my question is about the temperatures, eh, critical temperature in your in your superconductor diode, it's about five Kelvin or ten, ten Kelvin. I don't know the temperature. Right now. Uh, f five Kelvin. Uh, I, I'm not very uh, familiar with this, but there is a um, niobium. Depending on the thickness of the film, alters uh, its critical temperature. So, uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, so the eight nanometer film has about five point two five Kelvin. Uh, that is uh, my understanding. So it's not bulk behavior. I think it's slightly higher in bulk. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Angel Bustamante, and the Canon of Facultad de Ciencia Física at the Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos. Now, very quickly, we are going to move to Professor, uh, the representative of the University Federal of Pernambuco in Brazil, Professor Albino Aguiar. Albino? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Hey, Adrian. Again, nice to see you after a long time. Thank you. Uh, I haven't seen you for a long time either. <laughs> yeah. We are going to meet soon, I hope. Uh, congratulations for your nice talk. I have several questions, but I will ask on one about your diode, superconducting diode. You had worked with low temperature in superconducting. Yes. What yes. about high temperatures superconductor? We what haven't investigated. We, we haven't investigated this yet, but I, I agree this would be something uh, we would be interested to look uh, next into. Um, we haven't had time. Uh, this, as I mentioned, is brand new, uh, our results. So uh, yes, that might be something worth looking to, um, I don't know, yttrium, barium, copper oxide, uh, thin films uh, in the proximity of, a, that, that would be maybe one of the interesting features uh, to, to check next, but we hadn't had time yet. Okay, Adam. thank you very much. See you around. See you soon. Muchas gracias. Okay. Obrigado. Gracias. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Do you remember Professor Amino Aguiar who visited the University of si, Cambridge? Si. So, so, yeah, si, si, si. yeah, yeah. I, I, he, it was him who, who enticed me to do some superconducting spintronics that time, but I, I didn't take it much into consideration until recently. So when I saw that he is the moderator, moderator today, I, I, I knew he would uh, look forward to, to hear this. Yes, yes. Also, uh, to mention that Professor Amino Aguiar also has recently uh, accepted to be the, uh, the member, one of the members of the boards of the journal Heat Treatment and Surface Engineering from Taylor and Francis, which is the official journal of these uh, seminars. Okay. Oh, well, noticed. now let's. Uh, uh, today we have a very special invited uh, panelist, which is the, uh, the um, editor in chief of the heat treatment and surface engineering journal from the, from the Taylor and Francis online. It's Professor Delian Zhang uh, from China. Delian? Yeah, hello, hello, Luis, yeah. Yeah, your question? 
Yeah, hello, hello, Doctor. And, and then it's, uh, it's a very nice talk. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, of course, I, my, my specialty is uh, on the structure of metallic materials. So uh, I have sort of like a super, superficial understanding of uh, mechanisms. Uh, but uh, I think um, uh, probably the, the, in terms of the, the content of the talk, I'm most familiar with the, uh, the mechanism of uh, nanoparticles. I think it's probably kind of so. My question about the, uh, the magnetic nanoparticles uh, if they are dispersed or like whether the, the, the magnetic particles are affected by the, uh, uh, by the, the medium in which the nanoparticles are dispersing, I uh, would uh, like if, if they are dispersed in metals, would they have any effect on the magnetism of uh, nanoparticles? Uh, not as far as uh, I can see if there would be in a matrix of, of uh, non-magnetic uh, metal, um, then I still think this core shell behavior will be there, this organized uh, shell and an organized antiferromagnetic core in the case of nickel oxide. I don't know whether you would house it in a ferromagnetic matrix, whether this will uh, not have, an, of course, an impact as we have seen when, when you apply a magnetic field, you, you see an organization in the magnetic spins of the shell uh, as, as uh, indicated by the hysteresis at very low temperature, five Kelvin. So clearly that would have an impact. Now, um, if you think on organic metal matters, uh, I don't think uh, th that would have, so non-magnetic materials would have, sorry, <laughs> I have here a visitor. Hello. Here. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Delia. Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry. The school for me. Okay, uh, so I don't think um, I don't think that the, the impact uh, is so large. The the this core shell of the of the nanoparticles, uh, this this magnetic uh, disorder on the surface seems to be there, uh, intrinsic. Uh, it doesn't have to do anything with the environment. Um, so in our case, we have chosen nanoparticles which were uncoated and we have just studied them. But un unless you have some kind of strong magnetic fields in the vicinity, mm. I don't think that the results will be different. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, on the practical side, uh, I think I've been uh, thinking of this sort of for a few years now. Uh, just the, uh, uh, like if we dispersed the magnetic nanoparticles in uh, like a metals, you know, somehow, how could we make use of uh, such kind of uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, arrangement? Uh, because like typically metals are very in, non-intelligent because they, uh, they, they, they are, especially the non, the, the paramagnetic magnetic metals like titanium or, or aluminum. Um, by, by dispersing these sort of uh, magnetic nanoparticles, are we able to make uh, this one, like how how could, from your your point of view, is there any sort of practical applications of such thing or, you, you mentioned about the drug delivery, which is of course very nice um, for the free nanoparticles, but, uh, but in terms so of the magnetic our, signals. Our application, uh, or our interest was for application in a biological uh, environment um, for detection with biosensors, for instance, magnetic biosensors, um, or as I said, for the manipulation of these uh, magnetic nanoparticles by magnetic fields in an, a nuclear magnetic resonance uh, setup. Um, and there it was important that we understand why um, the magnetic, um, the, the, the magnetic size, the size uh, uh, structure is different to the physical structure. Application in the solid state in, in, in metals dispersion of, of nanoparticles uh, of magnetic or uh, ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic nanoparticles, I haven't studied. I don't know where the applications are. I know, however, that in other fields, um, magnetic nanoparticles are used for ferrofluids in, in uh, ferrofluidic um, um, 
uh, liquids which then are used for, for seals uh, in, in all kind of uh, ultra high vacuum applications. Uh, that is something mm -hmm. to do with uh, with metals, but th they are not embedded in the metals. They are just forming seals for for rotational drives and linear drives. Uh, that is what we use sometimes in molecular beam epitaxy. Um, I, I don't know. I'm I'm not. Uh, I wouldn't know where other benefits would re rely. Whether you could create some some kind of uh, magnetic field. Um, magnetic field uh, screening as a mu metal does for instance, uh, but at the moment you use their uh, really ferromagnets with very low coercivities as mu metal mm -hmm. shields. I don't know whether practically this could be achieved by embedding magnetic nanoparticles into a, a non-magnetic uh, metal matrix. That is beyond my uh, my, mm -hmm. my knowledge. Yeah, I have. Yeah. I must admit I haven't looked into this, but other applications are any kind of tracing of, of uh, fluid flow um, mm. Mm. W which which uh, we have done in the past as well. Um, but uh, yes, I, I would need to think about this. At the moment, I ha don't have a clear answer to, to your question, sir. Mm. Mm. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ernie. Mm. OK, thank you very yes. much, yes. Uh, thank Professor. You. Mm. Thank you very much, Professor Delian Chang, who is the chief in editor of the heat treatment and surface engineering of the uh, Taylor and Francis online. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you here today. Mm. Well, now, uh, very quickly, we are going to move to, uh, you know him, uh, from the University College of London and also from the University of Cambridge is uh, our friend Stuart Holmes. Stuart. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, Adrian. Very, very interesting. Your talk's always very interesting, so thank you. Um, I have been involved in some of the work several years ago. And I'm still interested in this possibility of producing this naturally spin polarized electron gas using your oxides. Would it be, so, the, so the question is, would it be possible to grow LA lanthanum aluminate on EUO? So turn it round. Would it be possible to grow the structure that way rather than to grow EUO on a lanthanum aluminate substrate? Uh. I think yes, there are, there are probably uh, people who, who who could uh, do this. Uh, to, you, you know whom probably I, I mean, Torsten Hejerdal. He has grown um, europium monoxide uh, by MBE. I don't think he has grown LAO on it. Um, the, the 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 true Stuart is uh, I, I try, which I try to convey in the talk is we are not sure that this two deck really exists. Uh, so uh, we 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 had, or of course we, we I haven't presented, but we started analyzing the neutron data as well. Uh, there are some problems which we are facing there, um, limitations with the algorithm of the software, really. Um, but I, I showed that's why I showed just the muon data because in the muon data already we were, would have been expecting that if there is a formation of a two deck. There should have been two features which we should have seen. One would have been that the information, the magnetic field inside the, the EO should be different to the magnetic field at the interface. Uh, so whether we implant the muons shallow or deep should have two different distinct signals. And secondly, um, you might remember that if you dope Europium monoxide with uh, electrons, you increase the Curie temperature. So we would have expected maybe the te temperature behavior at the interface to be again different, but the muons didn't show us this either. So uh, our data with the muon indicators, there is no clear formation, but then there are limitations to muon implantation. You, you can't make the muon implantation like a Delta function. You will always have a distribution. So even if you put your muons close to the interface, you will get information from the bulk or the LAO. Um, maybe taking the other approach to use a smaller, so to use a EUO and then grow the LAO on top of it would circumvent a little bit those problems better than the other way around. Uh, for us, um, it, it didn't work because we didn't have the facility to grow LAO really. So we, it was easier for us to get the LAO substrates, which you buy commercially, and we knew how to deposit EUO. So that was what we tried. But yes, maybe there are people who could do it the other way around. Now, that said, as I mentioned, we did neutron data, uh, which I haven't presented. And that is also inconclusive. But I can't 
tell you more because the problem is we realized um, when you go to such such areas um, has become apparent that there was I would have discussed this in the graphene in the graphene section when you come that the effects which you are looking for if if your film like a graphene layer or your interface is thinner than the roughness or on on similar large or similar scale you you start to run into problem in the analyzing the data and you have to alter the algorithm which people usually use when they do Newton uh, optics. And that wasn't the case until uh, a few years back when, when the first people like us started running into those problems. So uh, the last few years, we tried to advance the technology to, to understand when you take neutron data from such thin films where the thickness, like in this case, the interface, uh, the, the postulated two deck they said is one or two nanometers they expected in the theory papers. And this is almost on the on the size of the roughness between the two films. So when you run into these problems, uh, the uh, you, you can get unphysical results from your software when you fit the data. And that was what happened. Our magnetic uh, uh, scattering length density showed negative values, which is imp imp impossible in, in, in physics terms. So we, we realized that but this is not us. I mean, there are guys who write the software that this software has to be rewritten to address this problem. And that's what, what happened. So we, we're looking forward maybe, you know, uh, shortly to revisit this uh, with Razan. Uh, there is a software now which is called Ref1D and then we will have a better clue what's going on. At the moment, I'm, I'm quite downbeat that actually there is a intrinsic two deck spin polarize created there at this interface naturally. But I mean, you know, you have nowadays we have the technology, uh, molecular beam epitaxy, uh, chemical vapor deposition that you can control and you can deposit uh, two dimensional ferromagnets um, in, a, in a much better controlled way than to rely that such a thing appears at the interface naturally it would have been nice that would have been clearly because you would have had all the ingredients together and uh, off you go uh, we are not okay. sure that this is really working um unfortunately okay thank, thank you Adrian. thank you okay thank you very much it's to our holmes from the university of university college of london and university of cambridge okay uh, adrian we have today some students from the uh, Eurasian National University, which is in Kazakhstan, from Kazakhstan. Uh, they are also asked questions. Is, Dobre uh, dia, or is it merhaba? I don't know. <laughs> Simbat Utel Bayera. Simbat, open your camera, please, and your question. Simbat. Are you there? Not that. Well, let's continue with the other one. Um, Damir Tukaibai. Damir. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, hello. Um, I liked your uh, presentation. Uh, I, your first topic uh, was interesting to me uh, springtronics. Uh, I'm I'm thinking to uh, take this uh, topic as, as my research, uh, specifically Hessler alloys, Hessler compounds. So uh, I want to ask you, uh, as experienced, uh, as experienced, uh, uh, your opinion, advice about this Hessler alloys. Should I take it? Should I focus uh, focus on it when I take my uh, subject, my research as spintronics, or uh, should I focus on something else when I uh, when I take spintronics? Uh, can I double check? You mean Heusler alloys? Uh, yes, yes, Heusler compounds, yes. Well, this was part of my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> my, my doctorate thesis was uh, on Heusler alloys. Stuart also worked, Stuart Holmes who just asked, he also, uh, work with Heusler. They held at that time large promise uh, as being 100% spin polarized uh, materials. Um, and hence um, were, were researched. 
uh, I, I have, I mean, they have other uh, fantastic uh, applications uh, as uh, in shape memory alloys. I know that they are doing this, but somehow in Spintronics, they never made the breakthrough. So um, while they showed high spin polarization, the, the expected 100% spin polarization was never ever mentioned. And there were different um, arguments pro and co maybe with the termination and so on. And then I think many people um, move to other materials uh, which uh, delivered them 100% spin polarization or other problems emerge, which were more interesting than now optimizing uh, Heusler alloys. By themselves, they are a fantastic class of materials. Um, one of my collaborators, which was on the nickel oxide uh, talk, Professor Kurt Siebeck, he was one of the godfathers of Heusler alloys in, in, a, in bulk form. And uh, he has done a lot of research on them. And I know that people use them as, uh, as in, in, in a, they, they want to use them in medical application as, as shape memory alloys. Uh, so basically uh, altering their shape by applying a magnetic field for, for inserts in your body. So I think there is a lot of application possibility. Uh, there might still be a need you know, for, for uh, if if indeed they show high spin polarization, because they have usually high uh, ordering temperature, high uh, high Curie points, that what 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 made them so interesting. Europium oxide being 100% spin polarized has uh, uh, 70 Kelvin, whereas most of those guys are in excess of room temperature as a uh, Curie temperature. So it depends. Uh, what you want to do with them, I think it still warrants um, looking at, at, at them. I think cobalt manganese silicon was one of the highest um, hoist, uh, uh, Curie temperature hoistlers, which uh, some people looked uh, uh, as a spin injection electrodes into it. So it, it depends uh, on you whether you have an interest uh, in this um, or not. Surely, uh, you know. Um, there is scope. There is scope for 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 these uh, materials. So thank you. So from from my understanding, uh, it is kind of outdated material uh, right now. But but it it is uh, easy for beginners if I take uh, spintronics as my research. It's not, it's not easy. Uh, I don't uh -huh. say that it's outdated. I mean um, things come forth and back. It's like in fashion. Uh, it was once interesting, then it gets forgotten, and then it comes back. So I never say outdated, uh, but uh, people have started focusing on other aspects rather than improving the spin polarization of Heusler alloys as spin injection electrodes. It does mean that in 10 years time, maybe they, they start looking at this as well, because they have some, uh, some advantages against just pure iron but often people don't then go through the full pain of, I mean, a hoistler is a tertiary alloy. And if, I don't know whether you want to do it in bulk or in thin films, uh, controlling the stoichiometry in thin films of such alloys uh, is more tricky than uh, just evaporating iron. So people then just say, okay, what's the point? I'm gonna use iron as 43 or whatever, 42% spin polarization, uh, and I can still get something uh, done with it. Um, there will be always scope in material science, you know, to try to improve and maybe understand uh, why maybe the 100% spin polarization has never been obtained. Uh, the 100% spin polarization was always theoretically predicted from band structure calculations. And as I said, with the europium oxide LAO um, talk, you know, one has to be careful when uh, when you have obtained results by modeling, whether they represent the reality, uh, you, you never know for sure, right? Uh, so maybe they are, they are not fully 100% spin polarized. They have spin polarization higher than iron, but whether it's 100%, that, that, uh, that has to be seen. Um, it, it depends really, I mean, uh, if you want to do uh, a PhD or, uh, you know, or a master, it, it doesn't really matter what you are doing as long as you like what you are doing. So if you can get the motivation for one or two, three years, depending on if it's a master or PhD to do it, it doesn't matter which material system you are uh, doing uh, to start with. 
um, and get into the area. Thank As you, I said, I started with hoistless alloys and then uh, mo moved into other materials. Okay, yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Damir. Uh, Ismailov, Yerbolat, Ismailov. Is my love, Jerbolat? The camera, please. It's not there. Okay. Mekebai, Kwan Gisbek. Mekebai, your camera, please. Mm. Hello, everyone. Hello. Mm. Thank you very much um, for your presentation. It's, it was very interesting. Uh, I I not have question. You don't have okay. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> These are my preferred uh, questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Korkitov, no dialect. Korkitov. Hello, teacher. Uh, your your camera, please. Your camera. Ah, just moment. Hello, teacher. Uh, his topic is very interesting. Uh, my question is, uh, why is the in increase in the moment M and P in ZFC cycles? Why is there increase in the moment? S sorry, can you, I, I, I couldn't hear the rest. Uh, Could you please repeat, why is there increase in the moment? Just a moment. Just repeat the question, please. Korkito, can you repeat the question, please? Maybe has some problems with the signal. Okay, has problem with the signal. Okay. Uh, Diana Nebex Shanova. Diana. Diana. Not there. Okay. Any other uh, any other member from the Eurasian National University, Kazakhstan? Uh, yeah. Apparently, the internet of has uh, broken there. Okay, now uh, today we have to tell me by the from the from the student there. Now the question from the public uh, online. The question from the public online uh, from the University of San Marcos. The public, uh, James Godoy, James. Okay, perdón. Eh, no tenemos eh, preguntas del la, del pues de las redes sociales, solo felicitaciones por la presentación del profesor Adrián. Saludos. Uh, muchas gracias, muchas gracias, uh, señor. Sí. Okay. Uh, from, from Colombia, the public of Colombia, from the uh, Eliana. Muy buenos días, profesor Luis. No tenemos preguntas en las redes sociales de la Universidad Nacional. Eh, solo muchas gracias, aprendimos mucho sobre superconductividad. Gracias por, por elegir ese tema. Muchas gracias, señoras. Eh, todos buenos a, voy, a vosotros. Ok. Ximena, eh, la otra red. Eh, muy buenos días. Eh, no, por este lado tampoco tenemos preguntas. Hay muchísimos agradecimientos pues aquí tenemos una línea muy grande de eso y pues varios están varios estudiantes están entusiasmados con el tema muchísimas gracias profesor por haber tocado ese tópico ok uh, I think that there is one here uh, Simbat Simbat are you there? I think not here anyway uh, from Arturo Martínez already left I think from Mexico Okay, it's not here. Arturo already left, I think, because he has so things to do. Okay, Adrian, thank you very much for all your patience and your solving the questions. You know, on behalf of the of this uh, the Red Latinoamericana de Física de Materia Condensada y Ciencia de Materiales, uh, 
Entonces, eh, queremos, eh, we would like to thank to you and we appreciate you took your, your time for, for us for today and to give us these this, this, uh, small topics and very illustrative for now. Okay, now everybody, uh, everybody, please open your camera. Todos abran sus cámaras, por favor. Open your camera to say goodbye to Dr. Adrian Ionesco. Open your camera, please, everybody. Yeah, everybody, hello. Goodbye. Good, good Goodbye. Good Goodbye. Good Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, guys. It was a great pleasure. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, sit in the panel and listen to the talks in the future. Mm -hmm. You Fair know enough. that Thank there you. is a possibility that we organize the second Latin American conference on superconductivity and magnetism in uh, Ayacucho in Peru. There is a possibility that because we spoke mm -hmm. with the University of Huanta authorities and they are happy to, uh, to uh, um, support or be one of the sponsors. In order, we are going to speak in more detail during the next months in order to organize that next year. In this moment, I am in the Kazakhstan, visiting the Euro-Asian National University in Kazakhstan and working hard, very hard these days and we're coming back in the end of this month to, to, to Cambridge. Okay, my friends, mm. see you very much. much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. 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 Goodbye, thanks. Uh, Melvin, cierra la transmisión, por favor. <laughs>